Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Germany's inconclusive election in September ushered in prolonged wrangling between Chancellor Angela Merkel and a panoply of potential coalition partners. But now, following the longest period of political deadlock in post-war German history, an end may be in sight. After Merkel's Christian Democrats embarked on a difficult courtship with an initially reluctant bride, it looks like the new coalition will be a reset of the old. Once again, Germany's two biggest parties, the conservative CDU and the center-left Social Democrats, are set to form what's known as a grand coalition. That is, if the bride can be persuaded to go along, for it remains to be seen whether the Social Democratic Party base will approve the deal. So is this at best a marriage of convenience lacking in vision? Or could this grand coalition outperform expectations? Government wanted. How weak is Merkel? That's our topic on Quadri again. Here are our guests. Charlotte Potts is a political correspondent here at DW, and she also works for the German broadcaster ZDF. She says the new grand coalition lacks vision, and so does Angela Merkel. Alan Posner is with us once again. He's a commentator for the daily newspaper Die Welt, and he says, if Merkel's grand coalition holds, she'll be the strongest politician in the West. However, the SPD rank and file could put a spanner in the works, and then Merkel would be the weakest politician in the West. And it's great to have Jov Janssen on the show once again. He's a Dutch journalist and a political analyst who also worked for the election campaign of the Social Democrats in Germany and in the Netherlands. He says this continuation of grand coalition politics might lead to stability and progress in Europe, but also to growing polarization within Germany. Charlotte, the coalition agreement, which is essentially the blueprint for the government uh, and its goals and plans, has a visionary title. This is it. New impetus for Europe, new dynamism and cohesion for Germany. Your opening statement seems to indicate that you don't think the content lives up to that billing. That is very true. I mean, I think those are grand words that do want to paint a vision for the next four years. But if you look at those 179 pages, it is really lacking vision. What we are seeing here is basically easy fixes to underlying problems. So we are seeing a lot of presence for a lot of voter groups. For example, families with children or pensioners. Um, we're giving out a little bit of money here and there and spending the big bucks but they this coalition agreement is not really addressing the underlying problems that Germany will have to face and that will make Germany fit for the future and I'm talking about a very broken pension system for example a very urgent need for digitalization to bring reception to areas that are still without any cell phone reception and many other issues and it is not addressing that in the matter which two big parties in Germany could address this. Alan Posner, would you agree with that? Just taking digitalization, for example, this coalition agreement uh, says that it's going to establish a right on the part of every German citizen, no matter where they live, to have high-speed broadband by 2025. There are a number of uh, clauses in the coalition agreement about education to provide digital skills. Uh, there's quite a breakthrough in terms of the federal government's role in the education system. Does that really all amount to nothing? No, it doesn't uh, amount to nothing. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see how you can guarantee someone uh, access to, you know, a legal right to access to broadband technology if the firms which are responsible don't provide that. I mean, um, and I, actually, I think government should keep out of that. We're supposed to be a market economy. Why does the government decide stuff like that? Quite generally, it, it, as far as digitalization is concerned, I don't think that's a government... Uh, thing at all. It should be, I mean, that we, we say capitalism provides that, let capitalism provide it. You know, I mean, I don't understand why phone users in Germany, if they can't get access, don't go up off to, the, don't change their provider and, you know, whatever. I mean, but, no, but the whole coalition thing, it's not nothing. I mean, I think old age pensioners, for instance, would be glad and future pensioners would be glad of the stuff this, this government's providing them. Um, but... I agree um, that it's, there's something tired and old about this um, third grand coalition we've had. Uh, there's something tired and old about the Social Democratic Party, which has been in government with only four years outside since 1998. And I think, you know, it's more an atmospheric thing than 
you know, then you could point to this this and that point in the in in the in the hundred and ninety seventy nine pages and say that's wrong. It's more sort of a feeling of oh, you know, I wish there was something new in the air. Yeah, Jop Janssen, for you as uh, a person who has worked uh, together with social democratic parties. Uh, I want to put a question to you about the social market economy, as it's known here in Germany. Both of the party leaders, when they presented this agreement, professed strong allegiance to the social market economy. And if you look at the coalition agreement, it does contain a number of provisions that go in the direction of uh, strengthening security for workers, enhancing, uh, it, it may not go as far as uh, Charlotte says it should, but enhancing pensions, uh, changing labor market, and so on. Is the system of moderated capitalism that is enshrined in this social market mm. economy, is that really still appropriate for the times that we live in? Well, we have to see about that if it's appropriate. Uh, the thing is <clears throat> that um, uh, you see that this coalition, I think, is a continuation of the sort of social market economy that we have already, <clears throat> that Germany already knows since the last uh, 10, 20 years. And um, the SPD has never been able to <clears throat> put more ideology, uh, ideology in it. And especially this time, the last time in 2013, at least they had like minimum wage, which was an anchor, you know, th that they could show the voters like they really are changing something in Germany. Like you said, it's a comma here, it's a comma there, it's a few percent here, it's a few percent there. Um, the social problems in Germany, uh, even though it, the economy goes well, are still pretty big. Um, the, the, the differences between income, uh, flex work are still relatively big. Uh, I don't see the SPD having a coherent story about this. So it's, 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 they, they participate in a sort of conservative social market economy, which is very CDU founded in the last, for the last 20 years. I don't agree with that at all. No. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, if, if anyone has given up uh, uh, on their uh, on their ideas, surely it's 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 Merkel's party. Surely it's the Christian Democrats. There's nothing conservative in that um, in, in that program. Plus, this the SPD, the Social Democrats, get Ministry of Finance, mm -hmm. right? They get the Foreign Ministry, right? They get the Social Ministry. They get three key ministries. The Macros party doesn't get a single key ministry. So um, when it comes to who get, actually gets the money to do what they want to do, it's, it's going to be the Social Democrats who decide and not the Christian Democrats. This is amazing. And, if they can't sell that point, they can't sell anything. And Charlotte, uh, quite a bit of money is involved. This could be one of the most expensive coalitions ever uh, if it does, in fact, keep all its promises. 45 billion just for new projects. Uh, the head of the Social Democratic Party, still head of the De Social Democratic Party, because apparently he's going to step down from that position, Martin Schulz, said when he presented the agreement that it had the SPD's stamp all over it. Would you agree with that? Well, I think so. I mean, it's not very detailed, so we can, can't really tell. But I think it caters to the labor uh, unions. It caters to the workers. There are some improvements, um, immediate improvement for, for workers in, in terms of contracts um, that all made it in there. Um, also, in terms of health care, so very domestic issues that the SPD could put its stamp on. And I, uh, I, I agree that the, the ministry posts, uh, the personalities that they are pushing forward now within the Social Democrats, that is a huge deal. And, and the Chancellor um, Angela Merkel said herself yesterday, it, it, it's, been, um, it's been painful. There have been huge concessions made and losing the finance ministry for her party, that was a big deal. Yep, Jensen, mm. is all that enough to convince the SPD uh, members, do you think? They do still have to vote on this coalition agreement. And should they torpedo it, we won't have uh, a new government <clears throat> anytime soon. Well, I think the SPD members, they have a knife on their throat. Uh, they have like two options. Are they going to support this grand coalition? Um, maybe not all too enthusiastic, but with good minister posts, with a change in leadership at the same time. Or uh, they're going to bring Germany into a political crisis. So um, considering the fact that there are some social elements in this, uh, in this new uh, agreement, uh, and at the same time, these um, heavy posts in, in, as ministries, I don't think um, the, 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 the voters cannot ignore, they, they, they have to approve this, this coalition agreement. I don't see it fail anymore.
Alan Posner, <clears throat> what do you think? Uh, I, I, uh, I, many of these <laughs> new members who joined seem to have done so expressly for the purpose of voting no. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the big scandals of German uh, politics, that uh, the um, youth organization of the Social Democratic Party had a, has, been had a, has been having a campaign going on for the past weeks. Join the party and vote no. So you can, and you can be, all you have to do is to be 14 years old. You don't even need German citizenship. So a 14-year-old person shall we say, of Turkish origin, who doesn't want to become a German, can still decide, basically, who gets to run the country, can bring a government down. It's, it's, it's incredible, to my feeling, that this should be allowed. But the, uh, the, 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 the highest court in the land just decided yesterday that this is legal. I think it's a scandal. Disgraceful. Well, yeah, and I think the the, the youth organization, they do have a lot of um, feedback um, in, in terms of, I mean, the, they have a very strong leader at the moment with Kevin Kunat. He's already came out and said this grand coalition agreement, he was flabbergasted about it, that they could, uh, that the Social Democrats could sell this as a success. So I think the opposition within the Social Democrats, what we see in the, what we'll see in the next weeks will be big, but we shouldn't forget the Social Democrats are a, a grand old party, so to say, in Germany, and they have a lot of old members that will probably vote for this continuation. So I am um, quite hopeful that actually this deal will, will be pushed through by the membership. It is, of course, not only Social Democrats uh, who say that they are not at all sure they want to see another grand coalition. A majority of Germans said in a recent uh, poll that they, in fact, uh, are not enthused about the prospect. German commentators have been writing that if these proposals that have been made uh, in this coalition agreement on education, on pensions, on digitalization and much more had been made by the German equivalent of an Emmanuel Macron, people would be talking about an exciting new impetus. So is the problem not the policies but the personnel? Let's take a look. Angela Merkel's Conservative Alliance won last September's federal election, but with a sharply reduced share of the vote, her political fortunes were fading. And the Social Democrats turned in their worst performance at the polls since 1949. Some newspapers called on the Chancellor to stand up and take charge of Germany's political future, but Merkel didn't seem prepared to do that. I don't know how we could have done things differently. First, the Chancellor tried to build a coalition with the Greens and the Free Democrats. But that effort failed when the FDP walked out of the negotiations. Afterward, Merkel kept a low profile and refused to play the blame game. Then Martin Schulz rather reluctantly agreed to preliminary talks with the Conservatives on forming a grand coalition. Now the two sides appear to have hammered out a coalition agreement. Will Angela Merkel have what it takes to lead that coalition? What do you think, uh, Alan? The fact is the CDU has lost an important ministry, finance, uh, maybe even two, if you look at the fact that a new super uh, interior ministry will be going to the Bavarian Conservatives, uh, the sister party, but not always friendly to Angela Merkel's uh, CDU. And as we mentioned, there is a rather social democratic cast to a lot of this coalition agreement. So does that leave the chancellor significantly weaker? Yes. And uh, uh, the, there's a further point that the coalition has built in a sort of end to her chancellorship. They're saying that in two years, they're going to review um, their performance and see what they have to do. This basically means that in two years, you know, the opposition within um, the CDU has the chance to build up uh, a new a candidate to succeed her and give her the position to retire gracefully, probably saying, well, we did what we could and it's, it's great and now I'm going and they're going to thank her, give her flowers and everything, send her off. And then I think it's going to get really uh, interesting, see which way the CDU goes. Presumably it's going to tack to the right. But I would say um, she's holding on, but not for long. <laughs> Charlotte, uh, you said in your opening statement that she lacks vision, but mightn't she develop it in this last term in office? Many leaders do suddenly begin to think about the history books uh, in their last term. Would you expect that's possible here? 
Or she becomes the lame duck. I mean, she she had the chance to really change, bring about change for 12 years. Uh, we shouldn't forget she's been governing for 12 years, and um, I think there she she had <clears throat> she made a lot of improvements for Germany and some reforms, but um, never she was never a politician of grand vision. And I don't see that coming in the next four years. I think she is severely weakened on a national level after really the last four months have been a disaster for her and very difficult. Uh, in, in trying to form this coalition government. Um, globally, in the end, I think it won't matter. I think she, she'll still play a very strong role as chancellor, as the German chancellor. She'll be very well regarded. But nationally, uh, she lost political capital and it will be very hard for her in the next four years. Even though a successor, we also have to say that, is not in sight. She's been keeping them very on the down low. And the two that I thought might be rising within the party did not get ministry posts as far as we know. So it's going to be interesting to see who will rise up within the party in the next four years. Yep, Jensen, um, one of the uh, Achilles heels of the chancellor, perhaps the Achilles heel, was immigration. Her decision to open Germany's doors in 2015, strongly criticized, including by those Bavarian conservatives I just mentioned. They will now take charge of the interior ministry. Does that mean that we are going to see a strict upper limit on immigration and essentially uh, CSU, interior ministry minister, possibly flouting Angela Merkel? Well, flouting maybe not, but uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's already a pretty big thing. I think that they've already uh, agreed on, it's a little bit diffuse how they agreed on uh, between 180 and 200,000 migrants a year, um, which is already uh, kind of a victory for CSU. Uh, and I think what, what you have seen with Merkel, she has, um, from the moment on that she opened the borders and she said, like, uh, wir schaffen das. We, um, then from that moment on, she started to, to have a much more right-wing course on migration, much more stricter course. She had a very tough uh, integration uh, policy and, uh, and, and a restricted uh, migration policy. And under the leadership of the, the CSU, you can, you can assume that there will be some more tough measures on integration and migration. But in which direction that goes, it's still very vague in the agreements. Alan, if Merkel is significantly weaker, what does that mean for Europe? <clears throat> well, I think this, this, well, what this coalition means for Europe is the, is the following. Um, Schulz is going to be, Martin Schulz from the SPD is going to be foreign minister. He's the most Europhile foreign minister, uh, politician in government Germany has ever had. Federalist. Maybe barring Helmut Kohl himself. Um, he is going to aim for a sort of a Macron-type Europe, a tighter integration of the Eurozone, um, possibly a European finance minister, European econom economics minister, possibly even Eurobonds. And obviously Merkel isn't going to stop him be because uh, the finance... It was Scheu Wolfgang Schäuble in the finance ministry who throttled Europe. Now the SPD has got that too. So this is quite incredible. I mean, I'm... I imagine champagne bottles are popping all over the Elysee Palace and the Balaymont, uh, the seat of the European Commission in, in Greece Brussels. Greece Spain. In fact, <laughs> in fact, one person who has been waiting a very long time for a German government to get up and running is French President Emmanuel Macron. In a speech at the Sorbonne last September, he outlined his vision of Europe's future, including a common strategy on financial, foreign yes, and defense policy. Yeah. He said, quote, I don't have red lines, I have only horizons. Angela Merkel and Martin Schulz agree on many European policy issues, including the implementation of EU reforms and strengthening the European economy against increasing international competition. So will the new grand coalition, if it indeed comes to power, be able to take bold new measures on European and foreign policy? Yeah, Mr. Macron actually timed that speech that we just saw excerpts from to coincide with the German election in the hope of influencing coalition negotiations. He has made it clear he's waiting for a response from Berlin. And what I heard from a number of conservative parliamentary members yesterday as I was uh, in the Bundestag was mm -hmm. that they say they are now ready to get into the driver's seat next to Macron. So is Europe the main reason why people should be excited about this coalition agreement? Yeah, maybe that's the only that's the only topic you can be really excited about it. I, I have the idea. I don't think both, though that Germany is going to lead the process. I think Germany is going to let France and Macron, um, uh, you know, paint his horizons, and Germany will follow. And left and right, they will will stop some, or they will. 
uh, um, and, uh, and adjust. And we'll pay the debt. And we'll pay the <laughs> debt, yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, I think uh, after the Brexit and after uh, the financial crisis we had in Europe, um, it's definitely uh, Europe's lax vision that we already know that since this uh, more since 20, 30 years. I think now is definitely the chance with with uh, someone like uh, like Schulz on uh, as a foreign minister. He's a driven politician. He is uh, he's eloquent. He can he can paint a picture about Europe. And together with Macron, I think this is something to be excited about. Not necessarily in my country in the Netherlands, but. In, in, in big parts of Europe, they will be very happy with this coalition. Charlotte, quite fascinating, actually, that the title of the agreement that I read out in the beginning of the show mentions Europe before Germany. Yeah, and actually the first five pages of the agreement are on Europe before they move on to Germany. I think that's absolutely fascinating. It's kind of a post-national statement and probably the first one of its kind in a coalition agreement. So I have to say that is uh, that is quite the amazing thing about this coalition agreement. If you look closer though, um, and I'm playing devil's advocate here, but if you look closer, <laughs> then you realize that the propositions are quite in concrete. Um, so let's, Emmanuel Macron, for example, he proposed a shared uh, asylum agency. He proposed a shared finance minister, a shared budget, a shared defense budget, a shared troops for the European Union. All of this um, is not mentioned in the German coalition agreement and it's uh, very inconcrete in that What's sense. not conc in concrete, though is the fact that the SPD will now hold the finance ministry. They will hold the foreign and the finance ministry. That is a very significant departure from the last grand coalition and there is certainly mention in the coalition agreement of greater investment in the European Union including to fight youth unemployment. That's not negligible, is it? Absolutely and I think the southern countries will be very happy about it. Greece and Spain and and others who've been really um, looking with much hatred towards Germany and its austerity, pol austerity policies and uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, the former finance minister. So that is uh, quite exciting for them to see that, that Germany will end its austerity course and will uh, invest more in the European Union. But if it goes as far as Macron's wishes go, uh, I doubt that. Job, your opening statement talked <clears throat> about the potential for another grand coalition to exacerbate polarization yeah. in Germany. Will this coalition, if it does indeed come into being, will it, by working on Europe, help fight right-wing populism in Europe as a whole? And what implications does that have for Germany? No, I think in, in this topic is this, it's a big risk. Uh, I think you can be so pro-European, like 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 Martin Schulz and like the SPD, and like, like also Merkel has shows showed herself. But this is exactly part of the problem. A lot of people also in Germany who vote for populist parties, they uh, they feel their identity threatened. Their identity is strongly German, but they see a gov their government um, uh, transcending uh, um, sovereignty to the European Union. Um, so that's that's definitely a risk factor. If you cannot get these people along in your story in the European Union, you're going to have a problem on the long term. Um, but I think the internal cohesion in Germany is 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 in risk, <clears throat> also because this coalition doesn't have any idea about how to uh, about multicultural society, about integration of of big groups of minorities. I, there is not much in in this coalition agreement and. Those are the answers many Germans uh, who vote for right populist parties want to hear right now. Clearly, the rise of right-wing populism in Germany was one of the driving uh, factors for at least much of the language uh, that was put into the coalition agreement, Ellen Posner, and also quoted by party leaders as they presented the coalition agreement, saying that they had listened to the concerns and needs of ordinary Germans. Do you think a grand coalition can strike a real blow against the new right-wing nationalist party here in Germany? No, um, for the reasons that Job said. Um, uh, the, the coalition is going in the opposite direction of what the, uh, the, the right-wing AFD, the alternative for Germany, um, which is now the main opposition party, by the way, the biggest opposition party, going in the opposite direction. Even though the new interior ministry will include a homeland section? Yeah, well, a homeland section. But look, um, the, the so-called right-wing Mr. Seehofer um, from Bavaria, he's, he's saying we can accept 200,000 migrants a year. That's a million in five years. That's not trivial. That's 
10 times more than Mr. Macron and 20 times more than, than Theresa May or anyone else wants to accept. So, no, the, and, and they don't want, and the AFD, the right wing, don't want more Europe. So this is going to lead to an even greater polarization. What I see happening, I have to say, is that in at the latest in four years' time, you're going to see the, the Christian Democrats, a post Merkel Christian Democrats, tack to the right, form a coalition with the AFD, and we will be back to 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 to, ideal, to 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 left versus right, which will, by the way, be a great thing for the SPD because they don't have to do anything. All they have to do is stay where they are and say we're defending uh, what we achieved in 2017-18. Very very briefly, uh, <laughs> while we're on prediction, Charlotte Putz, our title: Grand Coalition uh, Government Wanted. This may not be the the government Germany wanted. But could it, given the alternatives, be the government Germany needs? Yes. <laughs> Very brief answer. We need a stable government right now and a chancellor, and that will be Angela Merkel. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being with us today, and thanks to all of you out there for tuning in.